From his farm two miles outside Doylestown, Pennsylvania, on January 31st, 1924, Mr. S.B. Denlinger was struggling to find a channel on his radio set. I was trying to get a Philadelphia station when I heard WEAF announce that Mr. Woodman, organist of the First Presbyterian Church of Brooklyn, would start his recital. It was 7.40 p.m. Broadcasting from the fourth floor of the AT&T building on Broadway in Lower Manhattan, the 10-minute program Sport Talk had just concluded. Raymond Huntington Woodman sat down at the piano and performed a selection of his own compositions, joined by supporting singers, including his wife. Radio receivers picked up the recital throughout the city and as far away as Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. We had the pleasure of listening, and it was amazing how perfectly your voice came to us through the air. Only 10 years earlier, radio held one primary function, to enable communication with ships at sea during the First World War. In the peacetime economy of the 1920s, this new invention was advancing everywhere into American life. By 1930, 60% of families owned radios. Broadcasting stations began to spring up across the country, offering opera, variety shows, news and sports, along with serialized stories. Radio drew families together in their parlors, inviting them not only to hear, but to imagine. It knit the country together with an invisible web of sound. But while radio had the power to increase access to our country's voices, it could also distort them. One of the most popular radio serials of the time was Amos and Andy, set initially in Chicago and then transplanted to Harlem. This comedy program traced the adventures of two black men struggling in their work and home lives. The characters were conceived and played by two white performers in a Harlem of their own invention, populated by racial stereotypes. In the 10 years prior to 1920, 300,000 African Americans moved from the South to the North in what was later called the Great Migration. Harlem became home to many in this new demographic, creating a community infused with cultural pride. From 1918 to the mid-30s, it produced a movement of sweeping creativity in the arts that became known as the Harlem Renaissance. Its musicians included Fats Waller, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway, and Billie Holiday. The movement also featured such writers as Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, and County Cullen. The painter Aaron Douglas, the sculptor Augusta Savage, and the photographer, James Van Der Zee, whose studio portraits and street scenes offered America and the world their own authentic representation of the Black experience. The shift in the city populations could also be felt in Brooklyn Heights. The inner borough rapid transit made five cent subway rides convenient throughout New York City but challenged Brooklyn's settled aristocracy, many of whom moved elsewhere. The once flourishing single family dwellings gave way to apartment buildings and hotels. Large family mansions were divided up into apartments and boarding houses. At First Presbyterian, the pulpit of L. Mason Clark had been vacated, but his courageous advocacy for religious freedom opened pathways for other liberal ministers. A young Union Seminary graduate named Morgan Phelps Noyes accepted a call to First Church in 1925. This would prove to be a significant step in his life. He met Marjorie Clark, the daughter of his predecessor. In a year, they were married. 
Churches in Brooklyn were beginning to feel a diminishment in their membership and sought out houses of worship with whom they could merge. In 1929, the Church of the Pilgrims approached First Presbyterian with such a proposal and plans were drawn up to combine their congregations. But then, fearing a loss of its denominational identity, the Church of the Pilgrims backed off from its proposed merger and five years later joined with Plymouth Church instead. In 1931, First Church did away with the practice of pew rentals, which for generations had contributed to its treasury. Noyes considered this tradition to be outmoded, reflecting a sense of privilege among its worshipers and discouraging newcomers. Some of the church's wealthier families had already left Brooklyn, taking their financial support with them. The stock market crash and the ensuing depression would further erode the fortunes of Brooklyn's established communities. In a letter to Session, Noyes wrote, I believe that the church has done many fine things during the past six and a half years, but there is no escaping the obstinate mathematical fact that the church has not grown. I have abundant confidence in the future of this church. It is not a dying church. It has a strategic location a conspicuous position in the city, and a great contribution to make. My hope is that under different leadership, the church can even now render its full service to the community. Noy stepped down and left for a new pastorate in Montclair, New Jersey. His successor was Phillips Packer Elliott, who had earlier served as assistant minister at First Presbyterian in Manhattan. He took up his position as pastor of First Church of Brooklyn in 1932 as the nation struggled under the weight of the Great Depression. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friend. Radio had introduced international politics to a growing population of listeners, and in March of 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt created what became known as Fireside Chats, a series of regular broadcasts about the issues facing his American listeners. His first address concerned his plans to foster economic recovery. Americans responded not only to the details of his messages, but to the way his voice provided a reassuring accompaniment to their personal anxieties. His fireside chats proved to be not only popular, but deeply important as they carried his country through the darkest years of the 20th century. In 1934, a set of lanterns was donated to the church and flanked the entranceway to the sanctuary. To Eliot, the appearance of these new fixtures signaled an urgent need for First Presbyterian to welcome the neighborhood population and to challenge them to be a light to the world beyond Henry Street. A new publication was founded with a title that reflected this need. Pastor Eliot addressed his congregation in print, announcing the arrival of the Church Lantern. The birth of this paper is an event of major importance in the life of our church. It is the one thing needful to bind our scattered congregation in an understanding of our church's interests and activities. And now, under the leadership of a committee from the Business and Professional Women's League, it is here. The magazine was an extension of the field and the work, which had ceased publication in 1917. The lantern is lighted from that previous effort. It will attempt to survey the passing show of the church's life month by month. The publication offered greater breadth of subject matter than its predecessor and reflected its readers' need to witness and understand the challenging times that called to them. It reported on the many communities within the church who engaged in discussions on immigration, politics, and culture. Elliot also introduced a new church initiative entitled University Nights, lectures led by experts that invited the public to a variety of discourses on the experience of religion. 
In his sermons, Eliot charged the church and its membership with the pursuit of the spiritual in every aspect of one's life. Whether in personal relationships or global politics, all occasions offered the individual an opportunity to find the intimate presence of God. In 1935, First Presbyterian celebrated R. Huntington Woodman's 55 years of service to his church. He had already established himself as a prolific composer of sacred and secular music. He was a founder of the American Guild of Organists, president of the Philharmonic of Brooklyn, and director of music at the Packer Collegiate School. In 1936, the Lantern acknowledged the occasion of Woodman's 75th birthday. No appreciation of Mr. and Mrs. Woodman would be complete without a tribute to those qualities which link every member of the choir into a circle of enduring friendship. Only the recipients of their kindness could tell of the joys shared, the help extended in times of stress, the sympathy showered in periods of illness and sorrow. One of his choir members wrote, Dear Mr. Woodman, thank you heaps and heaps for letting me come to choir for the last 14 months. I can't tell you how much I have appreciated it. The reason I'm leaving is very simple, because I can't sing. And I know I can't sing. And there's absolutely no reason why I should be there. There should be none but beautiful voices in the choir, and I just don't rate. You are so nice, and you don't like to hurt people's feelings, so I rather think you will be inclined to tell me to stay in the choir, but please don't. I wish I could tell you how much I love your compositions. Not only your compositions, but your playing. Two years ago, Thanksgiving Day, I sat in church trying to become reconciled to the fact that my mother was ill for the first and last time. All that winter, as she became increasingly sick, I hated to leave her for a whole church service on Sundays, but I came over every week to hear the closing hymn and your postlude. Your playing gave me courage to get through the next week. Courage also vied with anxiety on a national scale as totalitarianism grew in Europe and Japan. In a sermon from 1937, Eliot addressed an existential fear that gripped Americans. We feel ourselves living ever on the edge of catastrophe, and with confused minds and disturbed spirits, we gaze apprehensively into the darkness that obscures the days ahead. In such a situation, the church must not be idle or silent. On their radios, Americans heard the Catholic priest Father Coughlin spew anti-Semitic diatribes on regular broadcasts across the country. The voices that entered the homes and imaginations of distressed Americans reached a cacophony as the decade of the 30s came to a close. On September 1st, Danzig is incorporated into the Reich, and all Europe is aflame. World War II is a reality. In September of 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, and the world was thrown into another war. Reverend Eliot spoke to this moment by addressing his church. War is the great futility, devoid of all accomplishment, and it makes life seem futile too. How condemned our best efforts are to destruction. We put strength and money into societies for the upbuilding of life, into child welfare agencies, into education for children and young people. A thousand good causes have commanded our allegiance and support, and now all this seems but a whistling up the wind as war comes storming down the world's highway, bearing destruction to children as well as to their parents and nullifying everything that altruism has devised.
First Church's pastor and its beloved choir director ministered to their congregation in separate but interwoven ways. Their collaboration illustrated that American voices could be raised to speak truth and to sing praise. For the worshipers of First Presbyterian, faith stayed with them like music. It steadied and sustained them for what was to come.